Well, tan my hide. It's the Going All Podcast. Rap Gritty Gamuse. Yeah! Old Town Road, which it's got a meme where a whole bunch of white people like to do this little corny ass dance. And then when the beat drops, uh, they jump up and in midair, like we did at MAGFest, they transform. Mm-hmm. They transport into uh, country western attire. And they start like, ooh, I'm going to lasso a rope and all that shit. I'm on your TikToks every now and then, you know. I I upload a video every now and then, you know. I need to get get better about it. Old Town Road is a song that's played in the background. This uh, Lil Nas X, I guess because it gets used in TikToks so much, it's become its own phenomenon to the point where it, for a very brief shining moment, appeared on the Billboard uh, Top Country tracks yes it started climbing up a little Mm mm-hmm and the white people got scared (laughs) so (laughs) who's paying that much attention to the charts that much for real for real and to see something finally shake it up and for you to take it away that really makes me just go like okay something's wrong here and it obviously feels like racism because like i said if you go back on the going off podcast country artists have been trying to make this watered down fucking version of hip-hop for the last couple of goddamn years and the shit sounds whack but that's allowed on the radio if it weren't for the fact that like white artists on country stations were already making watered down shit i wouldn't even really feel like it was that much of an issue but it's like the fact that they are trying to make hip like watered down hip-hop and then you see someone who actually like it's not a perfect awesome song but it's just like that's an interesting idea and like as you listen to the song you know at first there is that like straight up and down as i listen to old town road there's that immediate feel of these are two genres that don't normally go together but it's just like as you keep listening to it, it's just like but you know what? <laughs> like, I would let it live. Like, it's just like, I hear the marriage of the two. What, like, what are they doing? They got the guitars. He's got the fucking Southern accent. What's he not doing? It's a black person making black sounding music. And I think that's the big difference with, uh, you know, Florida Georgia Line doing a song versus like Darius Rucker doing a song. Like Darius Rucker does a song, you know, I haven't listened to his entire discography, but I, I get the strange feeling he doesn't have any, he doesn't have too many uh, songs about racism or, or criticizing the police or anything like that. And, and maybe he fucking does. Maybe I just been fucking sleeping. But I feel like part of the thing that makes, you know, Darius Rucker an enjoyable person for a lot of country fans is that he's not really challenging to anything. But the thing about, you know, Lil Nas X is that, like, this isn't just watered down hip-hop. Like, this sounds like actual trap mixing with country. You know what I mean? This sounds like the sound of what black music sounds like right now, but mixed with country. I'm willing to bet if Post Malone did the same shit, I don't think he'd get as much trouble. I'm looking for the tweet and I can't find it, but a guy laid it out and the history of the country music chart and conveniently when they decided to make one and uh, had brought up the point that In the history of the Billboard country chart, there have been only four black country artists who have charted. Because we took one of them away, that means there's 25% that were removed by Billboard. (laughs) It is now 25% less ethnic. (laughs) And this is a thing, right? Because back in the day, Ray Charles was fucking really putting in that work. And he was doing country music better than the white artists at the time. And they were getting shook. Not until after Ray Charles was making that music did they create the country music charts. And at that point, they made it a little harder for your boys to be able to make it. Which is why wow. when we were talking about Darius Rucker, <laughs> and I don't remember if I left this in or not, but when we were talking about Wagon Wheel and Darius Rucker, I had made a point that they let him have a couple hits because I don't even remember that second one being nearly as big as Wagon Wheel, getting nearly as much radio play, but it kind of felt like they were just kind of doing it just to do it, just to kind of maybe seem a little cool because other than hmm. that, it's a very white genre now. And and what you're talking about when you got Florida Georgia Line, you got Sam Hunt doing country over rat beats or Throwing in cute little rap slang and lingo. Body like a back road. Did that even sound like a country song to you? And don't act like they don't play Taylor Swift whenever they fucking can, regardless of how country it actually sounds. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And it's like they'll take what they can get. And it's unfortunate because there's a lot of really cool artists out there, especially like in country, doing their thing. And when you've got Casey Musgraves, 
who had the album of the year at the Grammys. I gave it a listen. It shouldn't have beat Dirty Computer, but it was an okay album. Mm. I will give her that. And, like, if more country was more, like, open-minded and tackled different things and topics and ideas... Honestly... More people will want to listen to it, honestly. It's all the fucking same, dude. And that's been the joke as long as I've been alive. Do you remember when we were younger, the joke was, what happens when you play a country song backwards? Your wife comes back, your dog comes home, your truck, whatever. And it's not much different now because every song on country radio is either about religion, it's about your girl looking good in your baseball cap and your t-shirt, your fucking truck... It's And if it's not about any of those things, it at least mentions those three things in every fucking song. She looks good in the passenger seat of my whatever truck, wearing my baseball cap and her and my t-shirt, and I thank the Lord above. It's like country music now. You gotta <laughs> tick, fucking checklist, you gotta check bro. every fucking box. And if you got some guy coming through here with, it's it's not even a dirty song. It's not even yeah, explicit. Is there even, like, curse words in it? Like- There's not a single curse word in it. The only thing I would I would take off points for, and this is the only thing, is that for a single, it's like, what, a minute and 58 seconds? It's really short. Yeah. For a radio single, what's the magic number? Like, three and a half minutes, 325? A minute 58 is really short, and it's not going to get a lot of radio play. However, radio stations speed songs up anyway... So they have more time for commercials. That's why you'll notice if you listen to a song on Spotify or on the CD, it sounds different than it does on the radio because they speed that shit up because every little second counts and it adds up. If you speed up 10 songs or whatever, just enough, you got like 20 more seconds. Now, a little bit more, you can get another commercial in there. If more songs were short... Like this one, they would be sitting pretty. They'd have all the fucking ad time in the world. The only reason that anyone can come up with is that it's fucking racism. See, here's the thing I like to look up, though. Like, what did they say, right? What is the actual words out of their mouth that they said to justify why this isn't happening? And this is what they said. When determining genres, a few factors are examined. But first and foremost is musical composition. Hmm. While Old Town Road incorporates references to country and cowboy imagery, it does not embrace enough elements of today's country music to chart in its current version. Can we see this list? Can we see the fucking country music bible, the guidelines? <laughs> yeah! What does it have to or have? Or are certain people not allowed to see the guidelines? Are they not allowed <laughs> to know? I like that in its current form. Dude, we got to get the fucking remix, have a whole bunch of rappers and a whole bunch of fucking country singers on that shit. Dude, get it to the three minute, 30 second mark. Get a feature in there. That's that's really all you need. Yo, hit number one on all the charts and say, fuck them. You know what's interesting? And I just now thought about it, too. The, the, the key word in there to me today, today's country music. So let's just say now. If you've got an artist like Casey Musgraves, who on her album, it sounds a bit more dated, would that not be eligible? Because it doesn't sound enough like today's? My question is, is the definition of what embraces the elements, are they like on a slide rule? Like, how far back do you push the goalpost to like, what counts? It's like, oh, well, it sounds like last month's country. It's like, what the fuck does that mean? What's today supposed to sound like? And then since when do you want everything to sound like one damn thing? Do you not want it to be diverse? The only thing I can think of is the idea that it does sound like it's recorded, like, with, you know, pre-recorded instruments. It doesn't sound like a live band. But again, that is also the case for probably, like, fucking Body Like a Back Road or something like I, that. I would, I would be willing to bet, yeah. That's the only case I could even think of, and that doesn't even really work. No. You know? Here's the thing, Lil Nas X, he's being a cool dude about Mm -hmm. it, you know what I mean? He says, uh, the song is country trap, it's not one, it's not the other, it's both. It should be on both. I believe whenever you're trying something new, it's always gonna get some kind of bad reception. For example, when rap started, or when rock and roll began, but with country trap, I in no way want to take credit for that. I believe Young Thug would be one of the biggest pioneers in that, and... I, I, I don't know 
what he's pointing at, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know what that's about. I mean, maybe the, the his accent, like Old Town Road, came at a period feeling like when I was out of options. I was living with my sister; she was pretty much fed up with me being there. Uh, that's where the chorus lyric came from. It's me saying, "I want to leave everything behind," but during the month of me making it, it gave me a different meaning. So that Old Town Road would be the symbol for success. The horse would be not having too much, but having what you have in order to get where you're trying to go. This song has more fucking depth and meaning to it than half the shit on current country radio. As you listen to the song, to me, it really does come across like a, this started off as a joke, but wait a minute, I actually think I like this. <laughs> yeah, it's not great. He was really cool about it, but that... that that just feels like, all right, that's the nice answer I got to say, you know, just to sort of o- overcome the fact that it's like, no, oh, this is fucked up. Why are you guys doing this? Oh, yeah. And everyone else is fucking saying what he isn't saying. So m- maybe he feels like he doesn't have to. A ski mask fucking spoke out about it. And he was like, hey, man, thanks. He's playing the smart game. He knows the country atmosphere. He knows the culture. And he knows <laughs> if he talks a little too much that they're not going to put up with his ass. He knows that he has to play the fucking game. What he's got to do now is he makes a fun country single that's about love or some shit or or being in the club with with a girl who's wearing his hat or some shit like that. And then the next song is about fucking kneeling for the fucking national anthem. You know what I mean? Like, that's what you do. You flip it on, you make the fucking big hit song that's like, oh, look, I'm, I'm willing to play the game. And you go, nah, I was fucking with you. <laughs> now that's innovative country. <laughs> And there are some people who are actually, like, I I saw one dude, I forget who it said, but he was like, oh, yeah, I was a Bernie supporter and I lost a lot of followers because of that, because I don't stand with the NRA. There are certain people in country music who, because of their views and because of how outspoken they are, they get pushed aside. While we were talking about racism in country music, it reminded me of this Rolling Stone article from January of 2018 Inside Country Radio's Dark Secret History of Sexual Harassment and Misconduct. It only gets worse. (laughs) Which just goes to show, very rarely are people only racist. Very rarely are people (laughs) only misogynistic, (laughs) only homophobic, only transphobic. They're usually all the above. But uh, with all that said, I think it's time to roll in to our Patreon requested albums. Yeah, let's get some more questioning of uh, what genre really is with these next two requests. Oh, yeah, that's a very good point. (laughs) We're going to start with the more recent album uh, as a break from tradition. Uh, It's an unwritten rule here on the show that we normally review the newest album second, and we go in chronological order, but we're going to have more to say about that older one. (laughs) So, with that said, we're going to start with uh, the album that came out just uh, in 2018. Yeah, Avondale Bowling Club, self-titled album. Thank you, Colm Gubb, for your uh, Patreon request. And, you know, if you'd like to uh, make a request, go to patreon.com slash rapcritic or patreon.com slash muse. You know, that whole thing we do, you know, you know. So, let's get into it. Let's get into it. So, first of all, you hear track one, and you're just like, oh, snap. Someone listened to uh, uh, to Pimp a Butterfly, and they heard for free, and they were like, oh, is no one else going to do that? No one else wants to do the a jazz album, but with rapping over it? No one just wanted to do that? And dude, it's the whole fucking album. It's all over the place on this one. He's making up for it, not being anywhere else. <laughs> He's like, well, that's fine. I'll do it. This isn't your dad's jazz rap album. This isn't like a Tribe Called Quest oh. where they took a sample mm. and they looped it and like, oh, we're going to rap over it. See, and maybe every now and then we'll have someone do a solo or something. Like, nah, there's a full motherfucking band. <laughs> they're rapping with them. They're doing certain like motific shit where it's just like they're working with him in the rhythms and certain things where it's just like like it's not just a band is doing a song and he's rapping over it. it's like they're working in tandem with each other on a lot of parts and it's really fun to see that happening because it helps you sort of like really experience the uh, um the emotion that's going uh, on in the music I have talked about Macklemore's Downtown being like an experience. You know, it's like this, you know, six minute song where you're going all these different places. But this is like Love Supreme fucking uh, version of that. Mm. You know, Mm -hmm. it's so goddamn cool. Like I said, years gone by. 
uh, first song that's literally just catching you up on this guy's entire life. BT Dubs, this is basically uh, uh, Kendrick Lamar, but from New Zealand. Every now and then, you'll hear his accent come in, and it'll, like, help him create a sort of hard rhyme that, like, would only work with his New Zealand accent. And it's kind of like, oh, okay, that's you putting you in there. You know what I mean? Like, it's in little ways that it feels really cool, like it's on purpose, you know? I wasn't even aware that he wasn't from around here until he started saying bruv. That was the big tip for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then later on, he starts referencing, like, the prime minister and all these different, like, regional references where I was like, oh, shit. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> That's really sick that, like, you're working in stuff, like, it makes me want to check it out. You know? Like, it makes yeah, me want to yeah. figure out, like, huh, things don't sound too hunky-dory over there. I want to find out more about this. But, dude, fucking Years Gone By is such an interesting track. What I think was interesting about that song is because he's going from... Essentially, when he was born to current day, and he goes through it relatively fast, because you'd think if you were trying to catch someone up on your entire life up to this current moment, it would probably take you a while. He takes about the same amount of time on every topic or every experience, no matter if it was, like, life-changing or just a really small oh, thing that he happens to remember. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember at certain points, he deals with topics that are lighthearted essentially the same way he deals with topics that are way heavier. Like, he talks about his favorite video games at one point, and then he's talking about, like, oh, this girl broke my heart. Then he's talking about, like, oh, I moved into my own apartment. And then he's like, oh, yeah, my dad went to prison. But then he's talking about, like, oh, yeah, he, uh, this was the school I went to, and these are the friends I made. Here's my friend that killed himself. And he's going with... Oh, my God. And he's going so fast. And it's like, whoa, Mm -hmm. whoa, whoa. Like, if this happened to me, I'd be like, this song would be about this one thing. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) But he fucking... He's just like, no, man, I know you don't know who I am. This is, like, the best way I could just fill you in on, like, everything I think you need to know about me before we go into the rest of the album. And I think it does a really great job at that. And then we get the next song, which is about being broke as fuck. (laughs) It was a good track. Oh my gosh, that was so catchy, the fucking, uh, the little chorus. Friends was my, like, that was the first one where I was like, okay, this is a really good album. (laughs) So, it it was specifically the part where it gets to, like, the whole song is good in general, right? Um, But you see the the title of the song is Friends, but with the, the R sort of in parentheses in the middle. So, Friends, but also Fiends. And the song's about how his friend was a um, it w- is a drug addict, but how he's still like trying to be like, I still love you, but I got to be away from you because someone who's ruining their life, you don't want to be around that. You know what I mean? But at the same time, there's a part at the end where it does the friends, all my so-called friends, they don't hang around me anymore and it just like lingers on it in a way that like like the music is like really sparse and just lingers on it in a way that just feels very cold and just like you know what i mean you're just like really understanding how how solitary that feels um and then on second listen to it i I, there was one line that i had missed where he had said uh because, you know, the whole time he's talking about, like, you know, he's telling this guy to clean up his life, but he's not angry at him. It's not like that Hobson song, Old Friend, you know, where he's just like, fuck you, why, how could you fucking do this? Da, da, da. It's kind of like going like, hey, man, I know this is bad. You know, yeah, you do your best. But and uh, one lyric in particular, he says um, that kind of revealed it to me. He says, um, I ain't trying to judge you, bruv. You keep on doing what you do, bruv. But I got to be straight to you because I'm the one who introduced it to you. And I was just like, ooh. And it's just like, that's why. You know, it's like that's it's like you can't be too angry at him because it's like, fuck. There's that feeling of like, this is my fault. You know what I mean? That's fucking rough, dude. And going back to To Pimp a Butterfly, it kind of has memories of uh, you. Fucking lowercase you. Because, oh, yes, yes, Because yes. the first verse is talking about the friend that's addicted. Then the second verse is talking about his own personal experience with the drug. And then the third verse is like, like you could see them sitting on like a porch, just kind of comparing and contrasting. Like there's such an understanding and compassion in that song that's so fucking great. And then yeah, it just comes around with the repeated, uh, the friends don't hang around me anymore because it kind of comes from two sides again of I can't hang around this person because he's fucking my life up. But then it also can be from the other side of things of like, people aren't hanging around me because I'm like, I'm a disaster right now. What I find really interesting about that is that I've been looking up stuff about like dependent drug dependency. And a lot of the way that manifests is like, 
People are alone. They got nothing to do. They're solitary. They do drugs. You may feel that you need to be healthy, so you got to stay away from a friend that may be like going through something traumatic. But at the same time, it's just like people like that do need, you know, people because without it, they sink further, you know. And so th- there's that sad kind of spot there. And I really love that it, that he brings that up in, in a song like this. Then we get to fucking Water Medley, which I didn't... It's another song. It's one of those Kendrick Lamar, you know, three-part songs, you know. It switches up in between uh, two times. And it's cool, but it felt like one of them kind of... Like, what was that one there for? I'm totally with you on that, because it's... Uh... It's, it's a longer track, and it tries to deal with a few different things. Again, focusing around the central topic of water, like I remember the first verse, I'm doing like well water because I don't trust the government to regulate and protect the water we have, so I gotta do it myself. And then the second verse is talking about how like I gotta stay hydrated so I don't get a hangover. But then the third verse is almost just like... It's just, uh, trying to live my life. Like, I just wrote out, it's just generic, trying to live my life lyrics, you know, like. I think it might have been like, hey man, I'm just trying to live my life and do better. And, you know, drinking more water is just one of the things, you know, like. I, I can see it. Like, that, that alone isn't going to make my life better, but it's definitely helping. I didn't like the lyric where rappers do the thing where it's just like words with similar suffixes or prefixes or whatever, and they just continually harp on it in a way that's not really that clever. Like, I'm introverted, extroverted, hermit, underrated, oh. undeserving, perfectly imperfect, down to earth, earthling, personable person in person. Ooh. Like, what? <laughs> You're a personable person in person? In per- was, uh, that, yeah. was that clever? <laughs> like, ooh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill him with that line. The song that didn't hit me so hard was the next one which was old dogs which no dude i listened to that again i was just like i don't i don't understand i don't know how how you hating you a hater (laughs) i ain't even hating i'm just saying for for me it was it's so chill and laid back almost to its detriment because with me and my Mm. listening experience it easily became like background noise and that is on me because you know maybe i just wasn't as focused or whatever but the other songs grab you so so much harder and I think kind of going back to like Dave and Psychodrama, the songs on here are so intense that when it tries to give you a break, it almost feels like it's too much of a break. Like, mm. you got me used to that intensity. Now it feels like a lull because it's not keeping now up that Now it feels like same. you're not trying. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and I can tell you are because it's still not a bad song. It's just one I didn't rate as highly. No, man, I thought it was so chill. Like, the more I listen to it with each section, like, when that one guy comes in and his vocals are, like, slightly louder than the rest of the vocals on the song, but then, like, when that melody really starts to kick and you're really, like, feeling that, like, yeah, I just want to fucking relax. At the tail end there, just like, I just fell asleep outside one day, man. Like, all night, you know, like, not just like a nap. Like, I just fell asleep in nature. I just was out there. There was just that little feeling of, like, you know, that reminded me of, like, oh, yeah, man, I'm inside all the time. Like, you know, I should, yeah. You know, I, there's something about the the way he just related that just, just d- that you could understand and also want to, look, we're all imitate, we're all uh, influenced by media. Sometimes it makes us want to do shit, all right? I was just like, hey, man, maybe I want to fucking sleep outside. Like, you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm thinking, I'm like, look, hey, maybe I'm, maybe I'm take some time, you know? I might not because fucking, you know, ants and shit. But. Bugs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, that's that's the thing. Like, at first, I'm like, oh, man, it sounds so peaceful and serene sleeping outside, not a care in the world, you know, not thinking about the, the things that life puts on us. And then just like, yeah, but what if, like, a beetle bites me? Like, I don't want to do that shit. <laughs> But after that, though, it's uh, smooth sailing, uh, in my opinion. You got Home, which I hate to draw too many comparisons, but you're making it really hard for me not to. That the song <laughs> reminds me a lot of the song from To Pimp a Butterfly, where it's like, I thought I knew everything until I realized I didn't know shit when I went back home. It, the, song, the song sounds a lot like that song musically, too. It has the Literally same... Literally, the lyric that I highlighted was, I was like, oh, shit, that's basically that one. <laughs> and it's like, it's, it's like, it's not bad. I still like it. It just reminded me a lot of that song. And it's like, a lot of this album reminds me a lot of that album. But I really like that album. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> And then Quincy's March, if because I don't really have too much to say about Tea Break because it's an instrumental. I still yeah, dug yeah. it, but Quincy's March is that fucking chill, laid back song that really hit me way harder than than Old Dogs did. Because with Old Dogs, I don't even really remember what the overall thing of it was. But with Quincy's March, it's very specifically about his kid. 
and it's very focused on that one thing. And it was beautiful. It's man. such a beautiful song, man. And normally I'm really harsh on those songs like about your kid or whatever because they're so fucking trope. But this one, it had such beautiful lines that really like it humanized the dude. You could tell that this dude who's like, you know, I don't got a lot of money, you know, all this shit. I got a lot of problems going on right now, but I got this kid. And I'm going to do my best. I'm not trying to be this greatest rapper. I'm trying to be the greatest dad. And then later where he's like, I used to be so worried about doing all these things. But now when I'm giving my kid a bath and I make him laugh, that's all I want to do. Like, I just want to make that kid laugh. And it's like, that's what's important. It's like, holy shit, dude. That puts everything and the whole album like into perspective. And it's like, wow, goddamn, dude. When I normally hate songs that sample babies and kids laughing and shit it it gets annoying the way the song does it it's so interesting because at first the song sounds so fucking creepy because it just has a kid yeah you're right it has a kid laughing and like sounds of (laughs) rattles and it's like ew and like like the keyboard is (laughs) kind of eerie too what are you trying to say about this music (laughs) yeah yeah and then it's like oh it's about that kid okay (laughs) <laughs> that makes sense. I had no idea where you were going. <laughs> uh, overall, though, I really enjoyed this album, and I, uh, I ended up giving it a four. Uh, I'd give it a four and a half. We did not speak enough to how cool they incorporate, really, the uh, the rapping with the musicality of the jazz. You're doing it with, like, not a lot of instruments either, because I remember, like, you got jazz, drums, and you also got, like, a stand-up bass, and you got a saxophone on some songs and wind chimes. But overall, it's pretty minimal. No two songs sound alike, though. Absolutely, like, the way they absolutely. fucking make them work. You could say it's a quote-unquote gimmick album for it to be, like, jazz rap because, you know, it's not that much of a genre. But, like, you know, to, to create this genre and then have so many songs sounding so unique, I think that's a cool thing in and of itself. Uh, maybe we can't say the same for the uh, next album we're going to be talking about. <laughs> Requested by a girl named Sig. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your request. I don't think I was ready for this album. Um, <laughs> all I knew going in, looking at the track listing, was like, oh shit, this is like every single song has a rock group teaming up with a rapper or a rap group for every single song. It sounds like it's kind of kitschy and like, yeah, okay, whatever. This is kind of like a niche thing or whatever. But for the time, for 93... They were really taking a chance on this, because I don't really know how many people were really wanting this, but some of them really came through, I think. Um, overall, not so much, but I don't think we could leave a single thing out. We just gotta go in order. Fucking track one. <laughs> just another victim! <laughs> oh boy. Um, that's a weird track, dude. You got Helmet and House of Pain. Not the strongest track to lead the album. You probably should have started with the self-titled. You know, it is the perfect uh, song to represent this album. Like, there's a couple of cool ideas, like the little transition between the rock and the rap part. You know, like, that's a cool idea, but the actual thing in and of itself is not such a great idea. <laughs> and I'm glad the format on the track doesn't go for the entire album, because the way they do the first track is Helmet does, like, two verses and a chorus, and then House of Pain is like, hey, here we are too, and we're gonna do the guest first, and it's like, (laughs) Holy Diver, I'm a survivor. (laughs) What the fuck does Holy Diver mean? What does that mean? I'm sorry, I don't even like the Dio song. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like, not even the fucking Dio song, because I don't even know what it means in that context, but yeah, what does it mean to you? How are you a Holy Diver? How are you like a man of the cloth who's jumping in the ocean? (laughs) Let me know. Because it felt like, hey, this is Helmet featuring House of Pain. It's like, man, I want songs where it feels like they're pulling equal weight. And some songs on here do end up doing that. I don't know if the next track does. The phrase, I thought I told ya, was what came up on this fucking song. The weight of the world riding on my shoulders, cause I'm a soldier. I thought I told ya. Oh, yeah, dude. (laughs) When people say, I thought I told ya. I'm a soldier. We got this fucking first song, Holy Diver, I'm a Survivor, you're just another victim, and all this uh, hardcore fucking 1993 Jerry Springer shit, the Attitude Era and shit, you know. And then, track two, we're traveling at the speed. speed. What the fuck? What, what, what happened? What is this? What is this who, nerd who said that? shit? <laughs> yeah. I, who's responsible? 
<laughs> I feel like I'm just, like, I heard that, and I immediately was a fucking teacher at a blackboard. Who said that? <laughs> Who's responsible? Who threw that? There's a music video for this song, by the way, which fucking blew oh my, my mind. Oh my fucking god! <laughs> that, there is! That, yeah, they actually made music videos for two songs. I just wanted to know what the the beginning looked like. If they had, like, a guy with, like, really, like, you know, really thick glasses right up against the camera going, Traveling! <laughs> for 1993, that's what you'd expect. You don't even see the fucker. Nobody thought that was weird. Nobody thought that was interesting, especially after the fucking, Just another victim, hardcore, and then, Traveling! <laughs> To contrast, though, the other music video is for the Onyx song, and oh my god. Wait, oh, is it for Judgment Night? Oh my god, it's fucking insane. <laughs> Dude! <laughs> oh, like, god damn it, I gotta check that one out! <laughs> it's so funny. Fallen is just them hanging around, sitting around, just kind of swaying. Because, you know, the song's very easy. <laughs> oh, yeah, they, they don't fucking care. Onyx for fucking Judgment Night, they're, like, in the back of a fucking squad car. They're, like, jumping over on top of each other and shit. <laughs> Judgment Night! Ah! It's like, oh, my God, this is so scary. <laughs> Guys, fuck the rest of this album. You need to hear this goddamn song. I was listening to it earlier today, and I just had that moment of, like, you know, I've already heard this song a bunch of times. And it's just, I just immediately, like, when Onyx is the Judgment Night, like, you just do the fucking, uh, you just do the claws with your hands. You just go, Judgment Night! <laughs> You know? <laughs> Dude, I this shit is so hype. It always works every goddamn time. How is this not the fucking number one song in 1993? How is Beavis and Butthead not doing a fucking segment on this goddamn song? How was Butthead not doing the monkey? How was Beavis- Exactly, how are they not slam dancing to this shit? We gotta take it one song at a time because we're still on traveling. Oh my at god. <laughs> at, at the speed of a fucking snail. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fallen uh, has two very interesting um, samples, and interesting if they were intentional, but I think I might be giving them too much credit here. When they happen, you're just like, Because <laughs> okay, the song itself is about the rapper who sold out and yeah, had his yeah. big hit, uh, but now after the big hit, he's fallen. And it's like, oh, well, you know, I was, but, but now I'm fallen. And you hear the fucking fallen, fallen, fallen. The, Yeah, the second half of free fallen. So it's just fallen, fallen. <laughs> and it sounds so awkward. <laughs> and then in the background, you hear the dude going, do, 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 do. And I'm like, oh, is he doing the fucking fly like an eagle? Because one day you're flying and the next you're fallen. Uh... <laughs> I don't know if they were going for that, but that's kind of clever, I but guess. It's, but it just, it, it's so awkward. It doesn't work. Like, oh, no, it doesn't even work the in like, the, so the nerd hip hop sort of way. You know, it's just like, it's just, you know, herky and jerky and just awkward, you know? I'm sorry. I just pulled up the Judgment Night music video. Would you believe me? <laughs> if two I, music videos next to each other. <laughs> would you believe me if I told you that the video just starts with a fucking dude, sw like, shaking his head violently back and forth, and it's, like, just motion blur. <laughs> it's so 93, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to sound it any other way. <laughs> Imagine the, the couple of seconds right before he shot that. Like, he, he's standing in front of the camera. <clears throat> All right, let me get my drink of water. <laughs> You know? And then, alright, let's do it. <clears throat> <laughs> if that wasn't the first time you had to do it, that's like the fifth take. Oh, oh, my fucking neck hurts, dude. I gotta take a break. Um, but then we get to me, myself, my microphone. Oh, the fucking Run combo. DMC, two years past the expiration date. See, that's the thing, right? If you see on paper, live in color and run DMC... Mm. I I thought immediately like dude that's gonna be the fucking one like that's gonna be the goddamn standout because how can you fucking go wrong then I realized Raising Hell came out in 1986 mm -hmm. and we are now currently in the down with the king you look on the album cover Run DMC are all in black they try to get the kid and play switch up <laughs> Gangster rap is fucking hot. We we gotta jump on that train. We gotta be exactly. like Hammer. Fresh Prince had to get the Red Alert album. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he doing the DOS effects. Your boy can play. Who all of a sudden they've got they got a, a hardcore looking album cover now. We're we're facing the nation. <laughs> 
fucking knickknack patty whack ass rhymes he was doing. Oh my god! When I heard that, I was like, um. <laughs> oh no! I laughed out loud when I heard that shit, dude. I was like, no fucking way. Dude, that was their fucking MC Hammer pumps in a bump moment. I'm trying yep. to be cool. Ooh, this isn't working. Oh, oh. <laughs> all, all that was missing is them filming the music video, which there isn't a music <laughs> video, unfortunately. And they're fucking out at the pool with the girls and fucking Hammer looking up at the balcony and he sees his wife and daughter and he just has that moment of like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> For those who don't know. That's my favorite part of the music video. It's just his scrawny ass dancing at that pool. And he's like, yeah, I'm fucking getting it. I'm putting in that work. And he just looks up and he's like, oh, like he slowly stops dancing. Wait, and that's from the movie, right? That's from yeah, the, the made for TV hammer movie. <laughs> Rolling Stone said, Judgment Night's bracing rap rock is like the wedding of hillbilly and race music that started the whole thing in the first place. It's an aspiring rebirth. I kind of dug that. Like, it's like, yeah, that's right. Judgment Night, that song specifically, is <laughs> everything else is just, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Me, myself, and my microphone, the beat for that sounded like the, uh, like, from a, like a Simpsons game that's trying to do, you know, trying to throw in a little bit of hip hop in there, you know? Oh. <laughs> then we fucking get to Biohazard and Onyx with Judgment Night, which is just oh the most my God. hardest in your face. Um, the fucking video does it so goddamn well, it really does it justice. You gotta see it's all black and white. They got fucking Biohazard rocking out in a courtroom, and fucking Onyx are fucking testifying, and, like, they're in handcuffs. <laughs> it's so fucking sick. I'm not really familiar with who Biohazard are as a rock group, so going in, I wasn't really too excited for them, but I knew Onyx were gonna bring it, and I was not disappointed. I actually did a, uh, I, I did an episode on Onyx. I did an episode on Slam on, uh, on, yeah. um, on my channel. And we talked about how Red Hot Chili Peppers was kind of their inspiration, Onyx. They were like, oh, well, we yeah. wanted to do like slam music, but we wanted to bring it into hip hop. And what I find really interesting is that like, this was like right when Onyx got started. This is like 1993. Yeah. So they had put out Slam and then Biohazard worked with them on a remix of mm. Slam. But I didn't think it was as good because you could tell they obviously just like put their vocals over a different, more, you know, hardcore beat. Um, and I remember that was the thing that Beavis and Butthead had talked about. I had a, I had a, uh, a Berenstain Bears moment where I was like, it's like, wait, I could swear Onyx and Biohazard were, uh, you know, in a Beavis and Butthead, uh, uh, video. But no, it was their remix of Slam that they did a music mm. video for. But yeah. I do not like that one anywhere near as much as this fucking song. This is like, why the fuck did these guys not do a whole album together? You know what's interesting? You mentioned fucking Red Hot Chili Peppers inspiring onyx for like oh we got to bring like slam or whatever and then you got people like uzi and he was like rocking fucking marilyn manson shirts and when he when uh nardwar interviewed him he was like oh yeah gg allen he's so fucking punk rock or whatever it's like how are these inspirations of yours these so-called how inspirations, are they affecting you Show they're not work. coming across like, at all in the music my dude <laughs> <laughs> not in the slightest what we got next? Oh, Disorder. Oh, the back-to-back -back hits. The hits just keep on coming. Ice oh, tea. my gosh. Woo! This one more, uh, way more political, uh, bringing up the riots in 92. We fucking got Slayer and Ice T. Slayer a bit past the prime. Ice T arguably a little past like, his prime Like, right also. at that point. Yeah. 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 But, they, but they just needed each other just <laughs> enough. To put out a song like this, which rocks so fucking hard. I will say, it takes a little while to get there. At first, it's mainly just Ice-T trying to rap over the beat, and it's like, alright, you know, this is kind of whatever. But then halfway through, and it fucking switches up, and they are just they just yell out, LA-92! It's like, yeah. oh, that's what this is about. You just fucking hear, like, the double bass just kick in, and it's like, oh, shit. Slayer's been holding back this whole time. You thought they were fucking done. They still got enough gas in the tank. And they fucking rocked so goddamn hard on that second half of that song. Dude, fucking when it comes rules. to the end, that last part just feels so earned when they're just like, Disorder! Disorder! <laughs> when, when there's like passion and energy, yeah, it's like, oh my god, yes. It was all <laughs> building up to this, and you've, you've earned it, my friend. Right after that, we get Ugh. another body murdered. <laughs> another body murdered, or just another victim, part two. Basically, it's the same thing. 
<laughs> Which is a shame because here you've got Faith No More. Just another who... victim's body murdered. <laughs> Because Faith No More are a weird fucking group. Mike Patton is a weird fucking dude. So when you hear the song and there's just a random like, ah, ah, yeah, like fucking Tasmanian Devil's fucking younger edgelord cousin in the background. The, it's like, oh, oh, that's Mike Patton giving it all he's got for a song that doesn't deserve it. And the funny thing is, right before it, dude, these guys are so mismatched. Fucking Booyah Tribe, fake ass Chuck D sounding motherfucker uh. on this track. And it's just like, oh, like as soon as I heard that, it's just like, yeah, this does sound like a fucking anthrax, you know, public enemy type of thing that should be happening. In fact, that's probably why they did this joint, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. But it's just like, okay, but you're not talking about anything important. You're just doing like horror core shit again. You're obviously trying to sound like Chuck D, but you're just saying like, Ooh, I'm going to kill you. And I had to get it together to watch a body get murdered, which I don't think that's as badass of a phrase as you think. Cause it sounds like you said, like I had to compose myself in order to watch someone die. And it's just like, I mean, I don't know. That's not really a badass phrase. Like, you know, <laughs> if the whole oh. thing is like, oh, another body murdered, but I had to had to get it together to watch it. You know, I mean, ugh, my constitutions. <laughs> I, I just pulled it up. There's a music video for this song, too. Oh, for fuck's sake. And wouldn't you know it? This is the song out of the three. Not even for Judgment Night. This is the music video where they intersplice the movie footage. Oh, oh Okay. Why you wouldn't do Why it? Why would they not do it for, for Judgment, Judgment Night? Night. I, I guess they thought, ah, this is the bigger one. This might actually be a hit, and this movie fucking kind of sucks. <laughs> Starring fucking Dennis Leary, for God's sakes. Dennis, yeah, we didn't even talk about the movie itself. Fucking Dennis Leary's a gang leader. It's so 93. Then we get I Love You, Mary Jane, which um, I was not a fan of at all. I just didn't think Cypress Hill really needed to be on this album at all. I think they just kind of phoned it I in. I think it works because, like, you know, psychedelic rock group and Cypress Hill, I mean, that's kind of, you know, their strengths, but at the same time, like, it, w what was the chorus? It was just like, sugar come by and get me high. Like, did it not sound like, like, it kind of sounded like someone who was like, addicted, and they were just like, you know, they're like, come on, man, give me my fix. Like, it was just like that oddly uncomfortable, like, the way that they were singing, like, they weren't fully into it, like, they're kind of, you know, dead-eyed shit. I was just like, I don't know how I feel about this. We got Sonic Youth and Cypress Hill, two of the biggest names at the time, in, like, that circle, I guess. I think Sonic Youth did okay. They probably could have brought it harder, too. Uh, they didn't really do anything that particularly interesting. I think it's weird. Cypress Hill is on this album twice, though. Yeah, I don't know why you thought they needed to be called back and not like Onyx <laughs> yeah, exactly. or fucking Ice-T. <laughs> Cypress Hill wasn't doing anything today, so we got him in the studio for a little longer, so we had him record this song with, according to the track list, Pearl Jam, but it doesn't even <laughs> sound like Pearl Jam, like so I'm pretty sure they're lying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why would you record a song with Pearl Jam and not have Eddie Vedder sing at any point? Yeah. It seems like a very missed opportunity when he's got such a recognizable voice. And for 93, Pearl Jam was one of the biggest fucking bands out there. Yeah, exactly. And then we had Missing Link, which this wasn't necessarily a bad song, but it just felt like Del the fucking Homo Sapien and the group were like not really working together. Yeah, it seems like they just record their shit and then just sent it over to the producer who just kind of put them together. Yeah, like someone, like, Dell already had a rap and he just recorded it over them doing a jam session. That's what it just sounded like. And it's just like, it's not bad. It's just, it just sounds like I'm at, you know, open mic night. You know what I mean? Both of them just kind of sound like you got a, it's a jam band on one hand and then you got someone just freestyling. So it doesn't seem like either are really particularly planned especially not around each other yeah it just kind of happens but again you skipped over freak oh, mama we forgot about freak mama i didn't forget about freak mama you did <laughs> fucking mud honey and sir mix a lot uh, the, the, the team up we were waiting for the world was not ready 1993 was not ready for the superpower heroes combined Mud Honey and Sir Mix a lot. I liked the song way more than you did. I thought the song is a lot of fun. Oh my god, wait, you were being serious. No, I hated this. <laughs> I like I like the first couple of seconds when he had the flow that was like working with the beat. He was like da 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 and it was like right when the little tss, 
the little hit happened. And so I thought that was like really cool that he was doing that. But after a while, it felt like he was like, he didn't really know what to do after that. And so he just kind of started rapping whatever he could. And of course, the chorus was like, freak mama. I don't know. It just felt, it is another song that didn't feel like they were actually together on it. Them yelling freak mama over the chorus is the worst part of the song. It, it felt like a, a novelty song, you know, like, ooh, we got Sir Mix a lot, sing about butts again, you know. That is a thing. And Sir, Sir Mix a lot borrowing like straight up lines from baby got back it's like he didn't take it seriously and he just kind of thought hey you know whatever but just the fact that he's like rapping sort of fast over a rock beat i don't know i just think that sounds cool and that to me was fun i wouldn't put it in a playlist or anything but it was one of the more enjoyable songs on the album but we just gotta highlight my favorite part of the song when Sir Mixalot just takes a look around the room, <laughs> realizes what he's doing, and yells out, I just lost all my street credibility, y'all! <laughs> it sounded to me like he was being a stick in the mud. It's like, dude, just fucking have fun. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Why would you say that if you were exactly. so... You fucking shouted out Mud Honey in the lyrics, and now all of a sudden you're like, hey, fuck this group, they're a bunch of squares. And then he literally <laughs> says, like, oh, I officially sold out, y'all. Like, come on. Oh, is anyone looking for the real shit from Sir Mix a lot? But dude, according to the end of the song, it was banned by the FCC, which oh, it absolutely yeah. was fucking <laughs> not. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here, dude. This song was banned by... <laughs> This song wasn't even heard by the fucking FCC. <laughs> then, I already kind of mentioned a uh, real thing. The, it's the real thing! Fucking Cypress Hill ass. I'm fucking, yeah. you don't need this shit. Come and Die is the absolute That's the other most- one! <laughs> That's the lowest point! Get this the fuck off the album. What the hell is it doing here? When you've got big names on the rest of the album, and when I took the time to be like, all right, look, this is a band therapy? With a question mark. I can only assume their names come from what people suggested after they hear their music. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like ooh, th- 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 therapy? <laughs> and the rapper's name is Fatal. And I was like, well, I haven't heard of either this rock group or this rapper. So I'm going to look them up on Wikipedia. You look up Fatal on Wikipedia and it says Fatal is a rapper who did the song Come and Die with the group Therapy on the Judgment Night soundtrack. And there's no article about either Therapy or Fatal. That's all the information about either artists on Wikipedia. This was it, which leads me to believe they're just studio musicians that were there to just fill time. I don't know who the rock singer dude is, but he just sounds like an old man, like a dude, like it, not old, old, but like in his late forties, but he's trying to be cool with the hip hop. And he's like, yeah, horrorcore, right? I know what that is. I'm going to make you die. You're going <laughs> to come on and die. And, and, and you can't run. I will kill you. <laughs> like <laughs> you can just see the look in his eye of like, is this good? Yeah. <laughs> is this all right? Is this good? All right, cool. I'm gone. I'm out. <laughs> exactly. I can only assume that they wanted studio musicians to fill time because they were supposed to have a song with Rage Against the Machine and Tool. (laughs) Right? And neither Tool or Rage Against the Machine thought the song they recorded was good enough to submit, so it didn't make the album. And if you look it up on YouTube, because there is a rare mix of it, it's not very good. Was it up to Come and Die's standards is my question. Uh... Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> fucking sub insane clown posse level fucking music. Oh my god, that's right. That fucking reminds me that a note I had on Fallen was that it sounded like an ICP song from that last album. Yeah, that sounds like ICP. Uh, that second song sounds like ICP in there trying to be nice era. Uh, I think what I ended up coming out with was a two and a half for this. Uh, I gave it a two and a half as well, actually. I figured we were gonna end up giving this a much lower rating than we ended up man fucking judgment night and disorder oh my god (laughs) take time go to youtube after this podcast is over watch the music video for judgment night by uh biohazard and onyx and if you can still keep your face on from rocking so goddamn hard (laughs) Fucking Disorder, I don't know if you're going to have the energy. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Putting them back to back on this album was maybe a mistake. (laughs) Because it really leads you into like, wow, this album's really starting to get into it. Oh, Oh, that's it? (laughs) Start to pick up. I would definitely recommend people check this out, though, if not only for the experience. Because, man, hearing like 
this album really is a snapshot of 93 and it's so fucking interesting and just overall kind of like a fun listen even the, even the songs that weren't very good except for come and die and real thing if you just want to cut it off before those two I think the album is a pretty fun listen. It's uh, it's like a novelty thing, unfortunately. It is kind of, it does kind of feel like that. For the idea, going into it, not ever having done this before, I think they did okay. Yeah. They could have definitely done worse. Yeah, it, it was definitely fun for his time. And, you know, if you can turn your brain off and just enjoy that aesthetic, I think a lot of it actually is enjoyable. If you took Fallen... And me, myself, and my microphone. Because I feel like those are the absolute, like, what's the song we talked about? Come and Die may be bad, but it at least fits this album. Those two songs feel like the most, like, this doesn't need to be here. Fallen is way too odd and awkward. And me, myself, and my microphone is way too outdated and doesn't come together at all. But uh, that about wraps it up. For this week's episode of the Going Off Podcast, thank you very much for checking us out, giving us a listen. If this is the first time you've heard our show, all of our old episodes are on SoundCloud and iTunes. Uh, If there's an album that you would like to request us review on the podcast, head on over to either of our Patreons, patreon.com slash rapcritic or patreon.com slash muse for details. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, RC is on Station Head. I'm on Twitch. We both got Teespring stores. Both got merch we're trying to sell. And until next week for the Going Off Podcast, I'm Muse. And I'm the Ram Critic, and if you want to talk shit in order to avoid a fight, say what the fuck you want to say, just spell my name right, motherfucker, Judgment Knight! <laughs>